Who is the Traveler going to side with in the end? Will it be the Fetui who, despite having had several less than friendly encounters with the Traveler, still appear to be the anti-heroic underdogs that the narrative of the game is steering us towards in the end? Will it be the usurpers from beyond the sky, who have been slowly but steadily portrayed throughout the story as the ultimate enemy of all Bat, only for Hoyaverse to subvert the player base's expectations and reveal that Celestia have been the good guys all along with every action that they have taken being for the greater good of Bat? Or will it be the ancient dragon kings that trolled the world before the invaders, who have been introduced both relatively recently and in small numbers into the plotline, but still had an enormous impact on our understanding of Genshin's story? Or hell, maybe, just maybe, the Traveler is going to remember their main purpose behind journeying across the vat and actually end up siding with their sibling whom we spent and are going to continue spending the literal entirety of the story looking for. You know what? Actually, wait. Hold on a second. This is not the point of this video, but the entirety of Genshin Impact's premise is that the Traveler has their sibling taken from them by the sustainer during the opening cutscene of the game, and we spend the first two Arkham quests trying to fight them. But over time, the story introduced so many other relevant factions and factors into the mix that are taking screen time away from the Abyss Order that the Abyss sibling has become an afterthought. Genshin Impact really is just the Fatui against Celestia at this point, but anyway, I will get back to this later in the video. So if you clicked on this video, chances are more likely than not that you either want to know the answer to this question or you might also be a very cheeky one and already know the answer to this conundrum because yes, believe it or not, there are two very likely candidates and as it currently stands, one of them appears to be more reasonable than the other. Now, I will obviously get to the answer of this question in this video, but before I do that, it is crucial for me to impart to you the two pillars that uphold the rationale behind my stance on this matter. The first being the newly introduced forces of Numa and Uthia. Well, I say newly, but that's not really the case, and yes, even though Numusia energy was only officially coined with the release of Fontaine, the concept itself has existed within Genshin since the very beginning, just throughout different names, shapes, and forms. And I have already made a very long video discussing this topic in detail, but to give you a brief summary of the important details, Numa and Usia are two opposing energies that together belong to a force known as Archie, which as far as we know is native to Fontaine. But not really native to Fontaine, but let's just say that it is for the sake of this video because I do not want to make things too complicated. So, sticking with the vital stuff, Archie energies are very clearly intrinsically linked to and fundamentally based upon the forces of the Abyss and Celestia. I think that much is abundantly obvious from their color and properties. However, make no mistake, I am not saying that these are the powers of the Abyss and Celestia. After all, we have vision wielders in game with innate Archie in their visions that allow them to utilize either Numa or Usia energies depending on their alignment. And it is exactly that alignment. This word which I think best describes the properties of Numa and Usia because it is extremely important to understand that these are representations of the forces of the Abyss and the Divine, but not actually the raw forces in of themselves. And the reason I say this is because we know for a fact that the powers of the Abyss and the Divine will end up as separate elements by virtue of the fact that both Sleep and the Travelers in their true form will be playable in the future, and we already know those three do not belong to any of the seven elements of the gods, along with a few other outliers like Paimon and the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, who shared this theme with them. So, in short, Archie Energy is more like a rudimentary introduction to the power of the Abyss and Celestia, but not those powers in of themselves. When it comes to the elemental energies in Fontaine, their Archie alignment, whether it is Numa or Usia, basically tells us where on the scale of affinity towards either Celestia or the Abyss those characters lie. And what I find extremely interesting is the fact that Nouvelle, one of the Dragon Sovereigns, happens to align with Numa, which would be closer to the power of the Kvarena in Sumeru, which is by extension the power of the Divine in Celestia. With that being said, I will need you to hold on to this thought for a moment because now I am going to switch topics for a while. But don't worry, we'll get back to Numa and Usia towards the end of this video, so keep it in mind. Despite the fact that the Archons are important for our understanding of the relationship between dragons and humans, two of the currently known ones, Bal and Beelzebul, have absolutely nothing to do with the dragons as far as we know. And yes, there are some theories that the Dragon of Lightning lies beneath Inazuma field through the lightning sakura trees found across the eastern half of the nation. And yes, baptismal vishaps exist within the Byakuya Koko, and while Enkanomia is indeed under the jurisdiction of Inazuma as evidenced by the Inazuma treasure compass working in that area, we have no real connection between either Bal or Beelzebul with the vishaps and the dragons. But every single other Archon has had significant and mostly positive interactions with the elemental dragons of their own nation. 
namely Zhongli, Venti, Igeria, Forina, Rukadivata, Nahida, and you know what? Let us throw in Deshret in there too, because he was supposed to be the original Archon of Sumeru anyway. So, here I'm going to do something that I absolutely recommend no one do, especially when writing a report or making a video. I am going to confuse everyone watching by abruptly changing the topic of discussion halfway through the conversation. But trust me, by the time we reach the end of this video, this will make sense. If we choose to go by the conventional tropes, then logically the Traveler should and will reunite with their sibling by the time we start approaching the end of the story. However, almost everything we have seen so far in the story suggests that we are going in a direction of anything but that. Which is so weird to me, because Ether and Lumine appear to be two halves of the same coin. Since the very beginning, the game makes it abundantly obvious that the gods of Celestia stand as an obstacle in the path of the siblings. And the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles not only defeats the two in battle, but also separates them from each other, leading them to embark on two different journeys across the vat in search for one another. However, when the Abyss sibling reaches the end of their journey, instead of seeking their sibling and re-attempting to escape the vat, they join the Abyss Order, a group of terrorists with the ultimate objective of allowing the Abyss to engulf the thrones of the Divine, which does not sound like a good thing for humanity whatsoever, since if the Abyss holds the thrones of heaven, then humanity would become subjects of the Abyss, and historically, every single interaction that humanity has had with the Abyss has been profoundly negative, usually to the detriment of the humans, that is. So, the narrative makes it look like Aether and Lumine are destined to clash because one of them has pretty much perfectly aligned their goals with the Abyss, while the other roams stay that, meeting and interacting and forming connections with its people, and get this, it's elemental dragons. Regardless, before producing this video, I decided to perform a simple experiment where I released a poll asking people which faction would they prefer to side with if an all-out war takes place in the future of Genshin Impact's story. And not to my surprise whatsoever, the results were exactly what I predicted, with the Dragon Sovereigns being the most favorable by the players, followed by the Fatui, and then the Abyss Order, and lastly Celestia. But what did catch me off guard was the enormous favorability gap between the first two options compared to the other two alternatives, with both Celestia and the Abyss Order, which account for less than 9% of the votes each. Alright, here I need you guys to stop and think about this for more than 10 seconds and you'll realize just how hilarious these poll results are. You've got the Abyss Order and Celestia, both amounting to less than 16% of the total votes on a poll asking players who they would prefer to side with, Despite the fact that both the Abyss Sibling and Paimon, who happen to also be the closest people to the Traveler, are directly associated with the Abyss and Celestia. And to be fair, I will say that I did ask people who they would prefer to side with, not who they think the Traveler will side with towards the end of the story. But, 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 but... To play the devil's advocate here, even if I had asked the players who they think the Traveler would side with, I think that a considerable amount of people would have still voted for the faction they like, rather than the faction that they think is most likely. Long story short, what I'm trying to get across here is the fact that despite the Traveler's initial conflict with Celestia, and although the plot appears to be setting up Aether and Lumine against each other, it is crucial to remember that there still exists a very realistic possibility that the Traveler would side with either Celestia or the Abyss Order via either Paimon or their sibling respectively. Thus, we should not completely cross them out of the picture yet. Moving on, what I find to be the most relevant observation that we can make out about the Traveler's journey across Teyvat with regards to this video is the fact that with every passing nation in the story, except Inazuma, we are growing closer and closer towards an alliance between the Traveler and the Fatui, which is certainly very interesting for a variety of reasons, but for the sake of this video I will focus on two in particular. The first being the fact that Piero, the founder and director of the Fatui, used to be a mage who worked for the royal court of Conria before the kingdom's eventual fall, and during his time there, Scaramouche informs us that Piero became acquainted with the Abyss sibling. This information was actually game-changing when it was first revealed, because now we know that there was a conversance relationship between the two most prominent figures within the factions of Teyvat, which by extension gives Piero and the Fatui an unexpected yet vital sway over the Traveler by virtue of possessing classified information about their sibling sibling, who also happens to be a prominent figure in the Abyss Order, which is another organization that, as we have established previously, the Traveler is very likely to want to join. Now, 
The second interesting idea is actually not one that most of you might expect at first, however you will not be able to forget about this once you hear it in this video. I think that everyone agrees that by the time we get to Snezhnaya, if an alliance will indeed be found amongst the Traveler and the Fatui, then one of the major questions that will undoubtedly crop up would be the current status and identity of the Sovereign of Ice, along with the nature of their relationship with the Fatui. Remember, one of the Tsaritsa's primary objectives is to collect the seven Gnosis. By virtue of being the Cryo Archon, the Tsaritsa already holds the Cryo Gnosis, which means that currently the Fatui have five out of seven. The only ones not in their hands being the Pyro and Hydro Gnosis. Now, when Ganshi Impact first came out in 2020, the Tsaritsa's actions could be interpreted as her hogging the authorities gifted by Celestia to its Archons all to herself. However, following Act 4 of the Fontaine Archon Quest from Patch 4.1, we now know that the Gnosis holds the authorities of the seven Dragon Sovereigns, which the Primordial One arrested following its decisive victory to guarantee the Dragon's submission under Heaven. With this additional context in mind, it will be crucial to know what the Cryo Sovereign thinks of the Tsaritsa's actions, and more importantly, if the Traveler ends up allying with the Fatui, whether or not their goals and objectives align with those of the Dragon Lords or not, because if they don't, then by claiming the Seven Gnosis, the Fatui would be setting themselves up for a conflict not just with Celestia, but with the Dragons as well, who would logically seek to reclaim their lost power back. Nonetheless, I do not think that the Fatui will be successful in reclaiming all seven authorities, and here I am specifically using the word authority, not Gnosis, because the Gnosis itself, without the elemental authority within it, is basically an empty vessel that can harvest elemental energy and memories. I already talked about this extensively in one of my videos, so I won't waste time explaining it here. Okay, some of you might be wondering, why am I separating the Gnosis from the authority within it? And this all has to do with Nouvellet's final ascension line where he states, Now that I have reclaimed one of the seven authorities from the hands of the usurpers, I have regained my true form. I am now a fully-fledged dragon, powerful enough to judge the rest of the gods. My final destiny is to judge the usurper king in the heavens above. But until that time comes, I will lend my power to you. And assuming that he is not talking about in-game level ascensions with the line itself being poorly worded, then we need to understand that there is an extremely high possibility that by the end of the Fontaine Archon Quest series, Nouvellet will reclaim the authority of Hydro, which would make him indisputably the strongest playable character in the entire game. Lore-wise, of course, I'm not talking about gameplay. Listening to Nouvellet's final ascension line about reclaiming his power from the Usurper made me wonder and think about how this will take place in the story with all the various possibilities which would lead to the voice line's realization, and that made me remember Mondstadt's Arkham Quest all the way back during Genshin's release. And if this theory turns out to be true, then Hoyoverse pulled an extremely intelligent move taking into consideration the story years in advance. Towards the end of the Mondstadt Arkham Quest, we see Barbatos granting Devalin a blessing of animal energy, to which Devalin exclaims, Is this the power of the animal Archon? Now, Devalin calls it the power of the animal Archon. However, what if this power that Barbatos granted to Devalin was the elemental authority of animal extracted from his Nothis, effectively making Devalin the new sovereign of wind? This also explains why Barbatos was not bothered by Senora taking his Gnosis because what she really ended up with is just an empty vessel and this is far more important than what you might first imagine because if Nouvelle also acquires the authority of Hydra then the dragons will have already reclaimed two of their elemental authorities significantly boosting their capabilities in case of a potential conflict arising between the factions of Teyvat. Furthermore, going back to our discussion about the goals of the Fatui, if they indeed end up in opposition to the dragons in the future, then Venti returning the animal authority back to the dragons by giving it to Devalin before the Gnosis was stolen from him is an incredibly 200 IQ 3D chess move that he played against the Tsaritsa. And this is a perfect segue for us to return all the way back to the second logical pillar I abruptly interrupted earlier in this video, regarding the relationship between the Archons and the Dragons. Okay, before we proceed, I need to make one thing very clear. I am not claiming in this video that either Ejdaha or Devalin are Dragon Sovereigns. And especially with Ejdaha, even though it is heavily implied that he might be one, 
it is never explicitly confirmed. And this distinction is important because with both Apep and Nuvala, we get direct confirmation that they are indeed dragon sovereigns, while Ejdaha and Dvalin are really powerful elemental dragons. Although we don't really know what distinguishes a dragon sovereign from an elemental dragon, it is worth noting that dragon sovereigns seem to possess the ability to reincarnate into new successors that share their power, albeit with a different identity. This is extremely similar to how powerful devils in Chainsaw Man reincarnate, the most prominent example being how the control devil Makima is reborn as Nayuta after being killed by Denji at the end of part 1. This reincarnation concept is also well present elsewhere within the Hoyoverse, particularly in Honkai Star Rail's Sianjo Alliance, where the elders of the Vidyadura are dragons who reincarnate into new identities that carry on with their previous reincarnation's power and mission. But it is unclear whether gaining the authority alone is enough to allow a powerful elemental dragon like the Valin to ascend into sovereignhood. Still, it is worth keeping in mind that during Boer's second story quest, Paimon asks if Epep is similar to the Valin, to which Boer says yes, with the exception that Epep is significantly older and more powerful. This conversation provides a correlation between the two and opens up the possibility of Devalin ascending into the status of a dragon lord, provided the authority of Animo despite not being born as a sovereign to begin with like Epep and Nuvelet. But alas, the most important takeaway that I want you to all have from this video is that yes, while there exists significant motivations prompting the Traveler to join multiple different factions, I still believe, and to the surprise of everyone in Tevat, that they will end up allying with the Dragon Lords. You see, it doesn't take a genius to recognize why joining the dragons is far and beyond the most morally coherent choice. However, if the location currently shown on screen is where you reside, then let me clarify why this is the case. Take a moment and think about every interaction we had with a major elemental dragon we have met so far. You will quickly realize something extremely important about them. All of these dragons are friendly towards humans, yes, even a pep. When we fall into conflict with Devalin, we quickly realize that he was not attacking Mossad out of his own volition, but rather due to the abyssal corruption he endured from the wounds inflicted upon him by Durin. And no, Durin does not count as an elemental dragon, and neither does Elena since we are at it. The dragons I am talking about are the ones native to the Light Realm, the species that inhabited the world of Genshin before Teyvat was created by the Primordial One. In fact, if anything, Devalin has been a guardian of Malstad for centuries, assisting the animal Archon in protecting humanity. And you know what? Speaking of a dragon that assisted an Archon in protecting humanity, Ejdaha quite legitimately fought alongside Morax for thousands of years, and despite the fact that at some point in time his mental capabilities began to deteriorate, causing him to fall out of line, Ejdaha was still conscious enough to remember his contract with the Geo Archon and his promise to coexist with humanity, that he split himself into two parts to combat the erosion affecting his mind. And since we are on the topic of erosion, I want to take a quick moment to explain that I highly doubt what happened to Ejdaha was actually just erosion. You'll see, I actually have several problems with the very concept of erosion in Genshin Impact, due to the fact that not only is it poorly explained, but it seems like erosion is currently just a filler solution for a more sophisticated concept that the developers are hiding from the players or are simply unsure of how to implement yet. Also, there is another issue with erosion, which is the fact that it is portrayed as amnesia but for immortal beings, which does not actually fit with the geological concept of erosion in real life. However, this discussion requires a deep dive into the science of geology and the various problems with the concept of erosion in Genshin, so let's just save it for a different video. And yes, I don't believe that erosion is a thing in Genshin Impact. Look, at the very least, it is not functioning the way it is explained in game. I highly doubt that erosion is actually amnesia for gods. In fact, I strongly suspect that it is actually the process of bypassing Ermin Soul's memory altering capabilities, but like I said, I'll come back to this in a future video. Another interesting fact about Ejdaha is that he served the Geo Archon Morax, who himself takes the shape of a dragon. Now, it is extremely important to understand the following. Yes, Morax is heavily inspired by the dragons of Chinese mythology. However, it is crucial to keep in mind that Genshin Impact is not Earth and Liwei is inspired by China, but it is not China. There is no such thing as China in Genshin. What I'm trying to convey here is that while yes, it is true that Zhongli's design pays homage to the appearance of Chinese dragons, Within Genshin Impact's frame of reference, Zhongli's design stops being exclusively a reference to real history and starts to carry additional context within the world of the game itself. And within Genshin Impact, draconic imagery carries a very particular and unmistakable meaning. So, 
Am I suggesting that John Lee is an elemental dragon? Well, at well over 6,000 years of age, he is certainly old enough to support such a claim. Regardless, we don't have enough information so we cannot be sure yet, but what I am sure about is that Morax is certainly connected to the dragons in some relevant capacity. Otherwise, he would not choose to portray himself as a dragon, and once again, dragon symbolism in Genshin Impact implies very specific things. We are very likely to learn more about Zhongli's past in the future. All in all, Ejda have for centuries lived in harmony with humans, guarding them through countless trials and tribulations. And speaking of trials and tribulations, Nugalet, the judge of Fontaine, is not any elemental dragon responsible for humanity, he is one of the seven dragon sovereigns. And once again, just like Ejda and Devalin, Nugalet was entrusted by the Hydro Archon Fossilors as a judge and guardian of humanity. Furthermore, in the Institute of Natural Philosophy, we learn that the first Hydro Archon Igeria felt both great sympathy for the dragons and great sorrow for humanity, and Nouvelle appears to carry on part of her legacy, having reincarnated in humanoid form and given the task of understanding humans by Igeria's successor, Fossilors. And yes, I specifically mean Fossilors and not Furina, this will make sense in 4.2. Anyway, from both Fontaine Archon Quest and Nouvellet's own first story quest, it is abundantly clear that Nouvellet harbors no ill will against humans and constantly works with the humanity's interest in mind, which is extremely important to understand. Finally, we've got Apep, and ironically, despite being the most hostile towards humans on surface level, Apep's behavior displays precisely why the Traveler will most likely end up siding with the dragons in the end. When we first meet Apep, much of her hostility comes as a result of her body being sick and irritated due to the tremendous quantity of forbidden knowledge that she had absorbed from Amun after devouring him. And here, I want to point out something really cool. Notice what happens to dragons when they interact with the power of the Abyss. Unlike humans, animals, and other lesser elements, mental beings, they do not get corrupted and turn into monsters. Instead, by observing Devalin and Apep, we notice that the power of the Abyss makes them sick. And I won't blame you if you have forgotten this by now, but earlier in the video I talked about the arcy energies of Numa and Osi along with how these forces represent a creature's alignment toward the Abyss or Heaven, and when these two forces come in contact, they annihilate one another, producing primal light. Interestingly enough, Nouvelle happens to be aligned with Numa, which is very funny because his alignment is pronounced similarly to Numa Pompilius, who is one of Nouvelle's design inspirations. However, the real reason I'm bringing this up is because Nouvelle is a dragon sovereign, and the dragons originate from the Light Realm. So, if we extend this logic to the other dragons, then it starts to make sense why they cannot be completely corrupted by the Abyss. Their inherent Numa affinity allows them to combat the effects of abyssal energy similar to how your immune system works to combat microbial infections in your body. But this process exhausts someone's energy, which contributes to the feeling of weakness during illness. Therefore, logically, a younger dragon like Devalin would become extremely sick and angry when faced with abyssal corruption. But a dragon like a pep, who is far stronger and has a tremendously superior immune system, would just feel irritated and annoyed. But what's crazy is that even in that state, Apep still maintains her cognitive capacities and does not attempt to harm Boer and the Traveler, but warns them of staying too long in the desert and instructs them to leave immediately. Later, after she got cured, Apep calms down and makes it clear that while she absolutely despises the gods, she has no quarrel with humanity and does not mind their existence in her land. She even outright states that she has no intention of harming humans, her enemies are the Usurper and his tribe in the Heaven. Unlike the Abyss Order and the Fatui, the dragons do not go out of their way to commit crimes for the sake of bullshit like greater good. And unlike Celestia, the dragons are not oppressors and held their dominion over the world before the Primordial One defeated the Dragon King Nebulon. Finally, what is funny is that they are surprisingly indifferent towards a species of apes that colonized their world. Thus, the dragons are the absolute best option for the Traveler to ally with, due to the fact that their moral compass aligns with that of the Traveler almost perfectly. And I believe that Celestia is well aware of this, which is why the Traveler's closest companion and friend Paimon is likely slowly manipulating and leading them towards an unexpected path where they will reach an alliance with Celestia. Whether Paimon herself knows it or not. At this point, Paimon and the Traveler have grown so close to one another that if her true objective is to actually convince the latter to join Celestia, then the Traveler will have an enormously difficult choice to make between love and duty. And for the sake of Teyvat, humans and dragons alike, I sure hope that their choice 
will be duty. Okay, this video is supposed to be 15 minutes long, but as always with Genshin theories, random information pops up from the middle of nowhere, and once I remember it, I cannot unsee it, and I just get this itch to include it in the video, you know? It's like this constant annoyance that I have to deal with, and I end up including it, and uh, very slowly the video becomes really, really long. Anyway, as you can probably tell, there is a lot more to discuss when it comes to the dragons. Like, I have not even scratched the surface yet, for example, there is Ursa the Drake but everything in its due time. So for now, you guys are just gonna have to stick around and wait for those videos. Until then, take care and I'll see you in the next time.